Hello, and thank you for joining me at Blood Cancers Today Ash Roundtable. We're going to have a discussion focusing on MDS and anemia in lower risk MDS. I am Hannah Safa, Professor of Clinical Medicine at Tulane School of Medicine, as well as the Director of Stem Cell Transplant and the Heme Malignancy Program at Tulane. Joining me are my colleagues. Hi, I'm Jamil Shamo, I'm Professor of Medicine and Director of Bone Marrow Failure Program at Northwestern University. Hi, I'm Andrew Bruner. I'm an assistant professor at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Hi, I'm Tiffany Tanaka. I'm an associate professor for the Division of Blood and Marrow Transplant at UC San Diego Moore's Cancer Center. You spoke of quality of life, so sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you speak of the, the abstract that looked at patient reported outcomes, the PRO, Flusbatercept versus EPO. Um, can you share, shed some light on those? Yeah, absolutely. That I mean, I think that when we talk about symptomatic improvement in patients with MDS, we're hinting at this idea that we're improving their quality of life. And I guess in some ways, if you have to come and spend half a day with me in clinic, and then all of a sudden don't, maybe that is an improvement in your quality of life. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's been very difficult to consistently show benefits in patient reported outcomes in MDS trials. And conceptually, especially in low risk trials, we should be aiming for that because we are intending to give someone a new drug and re remove transfusion needs with the overall goal that their quality of life is improved. And so in this study, this used the commands patient cohort, they collected patient reported outcomes through the first 25 weeks of treatment. Um, and they did it both in the EPO arm as well as in the loose patercept arm. And what they showed is that really the loose patercept arm did better in all the domains that they assessed, um, particularly in shortness of breath or dyspnea, uh, loose patercept improved. And then the overall score, there's an improvement over the duration of the trial. And so I think that's an encouraging sign that that intervention is in the front line um, is also translating into an improvement in uh, the patient reported outcomes. Um, there's a lot of caveats to patient reported outcomes. Uh, if you take it before the transfusion or after the transfusion, you might have a very different response if you take it when people are in hospital. So there's a lot of things that can influence these kinds of scores, but I think it's really commendable that they're trying to get to the most meaningful thing. Are patients feeling better when we're treating them? And is there a difference between the types of treatments that we use? Um, and so I think that this adds to the frontline data and, and adds to the command study. I, I will say it's interesting because this data is a little different from the metalist data. So they did PROs during metalist, which was in the second line, later phase of disease. And they saw less obvious differences between groups. Yeah. And so this really does suggest that maybe timing of treatment initiation and how, trans how you're influencing uh, how transfusion dependent patients are, um, th those can also play into PRO improvement. But I'm, I'm pretty encouraged by this data and I think it's really in line with the idea that we can intervene early with loose patter septum in these patients. Yeah, I kind of like, like what you said about uh, the differences between the two trials because indeed in the Middle East the differences weren't that robust and yet the comparator arm was a placebo and here you have a comparator that's active therapy yes. so uh, it's difficult to compare trial to trial essentially but but it definitely is encouraging and I wonder how much of the improvement in PROs is because you don't have to go to the center every week. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's very important. I mean, honestly, I say it's, it's improvement in the quality of life of the patient as well as the caregiver mm -hmm. because they have to, to also come, come with the patient and that can add. But, you know, do, do, through the discussion, we are seeing some change in the way we look at MDS. So now we're talking about genetic mutations, right? The importance of the mutation and response because of those. So we're doing molecular studies on these patients and we're, we're, we're having like a precise classification or categorization. And then we started talking about quality of life, which is something that we never spoke. We just transfuse, give them EPO and then come back, see me later. So now we're saying, well, maybe we should do better. Maybe we're listening to them first. We're collecting data from them. And then maybe that should become uh, 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 
part of the trial, like an end point that we study on a trial. So um, I think that's, that's how I see things, that it becomes very important too. And are we improving quality of life just because we're making their hemoglobin better or is it something that we're doing with the inflammation of the disease set? So it's not just them not coming to receive red blood cells, but is it do, changing the nature of the disease and what we know about um, in the inflammatory mechanism that is associated and how they might be feeling sick from that and that inflammation that can be affecting other organs.